Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. HRN is food radio supported by you. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by 818 Tequila. Handcrafted, expert approved, with over 20 international blind tasting awards. 818 Tequila, imported by 818 Spirits, Manhasset, New York, 40% alcohol by volume. Drink responsibly. Hearst Ranch is a proud sponsor of the Heritage Radio Network. Learn more about Hearst Ranch at hearstranch.com. Hello to everyone. I'm Louisa Caston, your host for Let's Talk About Food, a podcast devoted to first-person storytelling where food plays a pivotal, if not a starring role. Everyone has a food story. Food is at the heart of human connection, at the center of love, of ritual, of need and want, and most of all, food creates community. And community is what we crave. Emily Broadlieb is a clinical professor of law and the founding director of the Harvard Law School Food Law and Policy Clinic. It's the nation's first law school clinic devoted entirely to providing legal and policy solutions to the challenges facing our food system. When I first met Emily, she was just out of law school and back from a stint working as a legal aid lawyer in the Mississippi Delta. As a young instructor, she was essentially being a friendly sort of mentor to a small group of Harvard Law School students who thought, huh, there's nothing happening here with food law, and they thought that should be rectified. Now, Emily is one of the leading voices in the country, and even beyond, about all the ways food intersects with the law. But I'll stop here and let Emily tell the story instead of me. You have done so much with the Food Law Clinic, the Food Law Society. You essentially went from one at Harvard-inspired programs all across the country at how many different law schools now? There's clinics like mine, I would say, at about five or six law schools, but we've been tracking the growth in courses in this area, and they've more than doubled between 2013 to 2018, which I think really shows the growing interest in this as a field of law. So tell me how it began. When I was in law school, I studied human rights and I studied mostly global work. And in fact, there's a part of human rights which relates to food and the right to food and the right to health. But my angle was more on humanitarian law and war crimes and post-conflict. So I was in law school. I thought when I graduate, I'm going to leave and I'm going to be doing this kind of work all over the globe. And for a variety of reasons that were both personal and professional, I instead took a totally different path and went to the Mississippi Delta, which is this sort of rural area in the northwest corner of Mississippi. And I was working as the liaison or coordinator between a bunch of university partners doing research on the region and on the ground community-based organizations, looking into research that would be needed or policy change needed that could really help the community to be healthier and have more economic opportunity. And food actually really touches on a lot of things, but at the intersection of better health and better economic opportunity. So one of the first projects that I did there was 
working with a group of local farmers and farmers markets that were growing food, they're producing healthy food, and they wanted to sell it to their communities. And they were facing all of these legal questions. So it was really interesting. My academic partner as a sociologist said, we met with these farmers markets, we wanted to give them training and networking, we tried to give them money, we said, do you need money? And they said, no, we just want someone to tell us what laws we have to follow, what we're allowed to do, what we're not. And that was really eye opening to me that law can be a big barrier. It's often very opaque. It's not clear what you're allowed to do or not. So it can be a barrier, but it also can be a facilitator, an encourager, like it can help galvanize better practices. And it was really eye opening and interesting to me. I'm just trying to set the scene in my little head because you are this nice little girl from the Northeast. You're freshly minted out of Harvard Law School and whammo, you are working with farmers in the Mississippi Delta. How did that work out? <laughs> yeah. So I will say first thing that I learned, or I don't even think I learned, but I, my instinct was I didn't go into any meeting saying that I'm a lawyer because not necessarily a good way to make new friends. I think lawyers get a bad rap. So luckily, I was affiliated still with Harvard Law School then, but my employment was really through Mississippi State University, which is the land grant university in Mississippi. They have mm -hmm. extension offices in every county and they do a lot more community work. And so I think things could have gone really differently if I didn't have that as the entry point to have conversations. But I will say that I had learned a lot in law school. And, and again, with this human rights influence about really how to support communities, but not come in feeling like you know what's the right answer, like really listening and trying to figure out what can you do that's going to be the most beneficial. And then I also was really influenced by my colleagues that I work with there, many of whom were sociologists, and were doing a lot of community engaged work. So the first thing I did was listen, which is hard because I love to talk, but I did a lot of listening and really thinking about both this area of law that I think was understudied and underexplored, but also just thinking of being a lawyer in a really different way from what I had thought that I would do or what people picture with a lawyer. One of my superpowers, so to speak, is that I now I'm really able to listen to partners talk about their challenges, really divorced from like law or policy, just hear what the barriers are. And then transform those into, okay, here are the ways that really tie into these like legal systems and structures. And here are the things that you might think about, we might think about working to change that will get to the heart of that problem. So it was really a gift to like, have that opportunity there. And I not only got to work with partners, but I got to bring a lot of law students from Harvard, which kind of led to me coming back here after. It was also really eye opening for them getting to work, engaging with community, but also we have some students from rural areas and from the South, but the bulk of our students were coming from the coast and it was a chance for them to really get to experience a different part of the country and a rural area and see what the challenges and norms and issues are in that context. What kind of legal problems were farmers worried about? There were actually a lot. I'll tell you about a couple one big one at the time, and this was the first thing we worked on, was in Mississippi law, unlike most states now, most states no longer tax groceries. So here in Massachusetts, if you go to the grocery store, mm -hmm. there's no tax on basic foods. Unless you're buying like something prepared in a restaurant or something, you it will not be taxed. Mississippi still has a sales tax that applies to retail and groceries, but there was an exemption in the law for farmers selling farm produce from their farm. The question was, when you bring the farmers together at a farmer's market, is that more like a farm in which it would be tax exempt? Or is it more like a grocery store because they're setting it up in one place and yep. your shop, it's a multi-stop shop. And depending on the county of the state, the tax commission was treating them in different ways. So the first question was, do we need to pay tax? In which case we said, it's not really clear. And so what that really led to was us going to the state legislature and saying, you should really expand the exemption for sales on a farm to also incorporate farmer's markets. Because farmer's markets really bring a lot of the same benefits that you were getting. You know, you wanted to make it tax exempt on farms to encourage farmers and to make it easier for people to buy produce. Farmer's markets further all of those goals. But if you don't explicitly say that in the law, then 
you'll keep having these situations where the tax inspectors are showing up at the farmer's market and trying to go collect money from mm-hmm. all the farmers. We were successful. It was actually the first time I've ever tried to change the law. The law passed unanimously the first time we raised it. And I was like, this is awesome. I'm so good. This is going to be, this is so Yay easy. Me. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing has ever been that easy again, ever since. I was hooked before I realized what I was getting myself into. So the other thing that, that was, you know, another early issue that came up that actually I still work on now was that there was a question about if you grow sweet potatoes or tomatoes or okra, you can just sell them without having to go through any inspections or processes. But if you wanted to bake them into a sweet potato pie or canned okra or some sort of tomato sauce, can you do that in a home kitchen or do you need to go through some sort of licensed facility? That was a really early question and there was some lack of clarity. And so that was another one where we said to our farmers, right now under Mississippi law, you can't do a lot in your home kitchen. But we were looking around the country and we were seeing all these other states were were Mm -hmm. allowing exemptions so people could sell things in a home kitchen. And again, it's great for economic development. It's great for farmers. A lot of the farmers we work with were really small scale producers. They weren't very professional. They sometimes would have a bumper crop of peaches and they couldn't sell them quickly enough. So being able to to can them or make something out of them and sell, that really made it possible for them to do the things they were doing. So that was like another question that really has also shaped a lot of work that I've done since then. And then you did that for a year, two years in Mississippi. Did you develop a drawl? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but, you know, I, I had to talk a lot slower. <laughs> And I realized the first time I gave, you know, a presentation and at the end, everyone was looking really confused. And I thought, I'm going to need to take a breath in between every word. Just slow it down for them. Yeah. Slow it down. Yeah. It, it is a misconception, I think, among Northerners that people who speak slower aren't as smart. And they that is so wrong. They just take the time to think while we're so busy running our mouths. <laughs> Totally true. It's actually great. If you slow down, you're more deliberate. Some of the most poignant and thoughtful things that I've heard or learned ever came from partners that I work with in Mississippi that were just so thoughtful about the work that they were doing. And then you found your way back to Boston. How'd that happen? (laughs) At the end of my time there, food was a big part of what I was doing, but I was working on a lot of other topics. Food found its way to me. I really realized at the end, I had some of these policy successes in Mississippi. Then I started hearing from different food policy councils and food groups in Arkansas and Alabama and Tennessee that said, can you help us too? So I kind of had this portfolio that emerged really organically. Every question was really different, really interesting. There was an issue in Memphis where they had an old school set of food safety laws that predated our federal food safety laws. But they'd never really been updated. They'd never been repealed. And in many cases, it was just unclear what law applies. Is it this outdated law or is it more updated federal law? And where there was a gap, which one should be applying? That was one. There was an issue that came up from a group in Arkansas that wanted to think about labeling at farmers markets to be clear which foods were really grown by the vendor versus which were resold food that was coming from retail or something like that. And I realized law students were really interested in this, which was really amazing. So at the time, the dean of the law school, Martha Minow, who's now been since then a great mentor and supporter and collaborator, said, why don't you come back here? And the students seem to really like working on the things you're doing. We're not really clear where it will go, but I took her up on that and came back as a fellow, kind of a baby professor, so to speak. There were many more steps to be able to actually be a faculty member, but I came as a fellow and a couple of things happened. The first was that I brought these new projects along and students were signing up to work on them. I was initially for the first year, I was a fellow in our health policy clinic, but I was building this really big portfolio of food policy. And then the other thing that happened was there was a student group forming at the same time here of students that created the first U.S. Student Food Law Society. And I know the founder, Nate Rosenberg, who's still a dear friend and collaborator as well with our clinic. 
I met Nate. He and one of the other members of the Food Law Society accosted me in a CVS. Somehow they knew who I was. They said, you need to know who <laughs> Did they follow you to the CBS? Because now I'm worried. <laughs> they were, I was there and they were there. And it was all two blocks from the law school and two blocks from my house. And there it. it was. They were great. <laughs> they were great. So they reached out and said, we want to start this student organization. And we've gone to all the faculty and no one will, to, to start a formal student group, you need a faculty supervisor. No faculty want to be our supervisor, but we spoke to the dean of students and they have agreed that a fellow can serve that role. And we've targeted you because we know you're coming back as a fellow and you have been doing food work. And so it was really, I mean, the timing was great. Coming in, having this like really motivated and excited group of students. I had this sort of organically growing set of partners that were that had projects for us to work on. And the idea of a clinic in the law school setting is really that you are training law students to do practical work by working hands-on with clients and partners. And so it came together. And in that first year, I wrote a syllabus for a food law course that I started teaching the following year. And then it grew. And then it grew. <laughs> and we'll be back with Emily Broadleib in a moment and hear how the scope of food law began to grow and grow. This episode is brought to you by 818 Tequila. 818 creates their tequila using traditional methods at a family-owned and operated distillery in Jalisco, Mexico. 818 is created from fully matured blue agave from the Los Altos and Valles regions of tequila. It is then slow cooked for over 30 hours, extracted using traditional Tejona wheels, distilled twice in copper pot stills, and aged in American and French oak barrels. This process creates the best tasting, highest quality tequila possible. Their tequilas have received over 20 blind tasting awards. They strive for excellence in every sip. 818's Blanco is sweet and smooth with undertones of tropical and citrus fruits. Their Reposado is soft and balanced with notes of caramel and vanilla. Their Añejo is elegant and velvety, with crisp herbal notes and a warm vanilla finish. Visit drink818.com to learn more about their tequila and find it near you. 818 Tequila, imported by 818 Spirits, Manhasset, New York, 40% alcohol by volume. Drink responsibly. Hearst Ranch is a proud sponsor of the Heritage Radio Network. The Hearst family has been raising cattle on the rich, sustainable native grasslands of California's Central Coast for over 150 years. Piedra Blanca Rancho in San Simeon is the original Hearst Ranch, founded by George Hearst in 1865. George's son was the famous publisher, William Randolph Hearst. In addition to being known for building the iconic Hearst Castle, William was, like his father before him, an avid rancher. In his words, I would rather spend a month at the ranch than any place in the world. Thanks to one of the largest land conservation easements in California history, a joint effort with the California Rangeland Trust, the American Land Conservancy, and the state of California, the working landscape at Hearst Ranch will be preserved forever. Learn more about Hearst Ranch at hearstranch.com. And we are back with Emily. And once you started to roll, everything from food labeling to food safety issues to school food to let's talk about the things you've accomplished in the, the different areas of food law as whole and food law through Emily at Harvard has accomplished. First, I needed to really educate my colleagues on the faculty here about what I was doing and about this field. It's exciting when you're doing something that's new, but if there's not really a field around you, then there's not a lot of people to collaborate with. And it's hard to show the value to your colleagues. So some of my work has really been documenting and supporting work with colleagues in this space. One of the things I did was an article looking at how many law schools have courses in food law and how many have clinics like mine that are solely focused on food law and policy. And then how many have other clinics like in areas like environmental law or human rights that 
are broader, but a big portion of their work is focused on food. And what we found was really interesting. We looked at the data in 2013. We found of the top 100 law schools, about 20 at that time were teaching a course in food law. There was one dedicated clinic, which was mine. And then I think there were about, I don't know, maybe 30 other clinics in other fields that food was a big piece of what they did. In 2018, we redid this survey of 10 indicators amongst 100 law schools. And by that time, it was 34 schools were teaching a dedicated food law and policy course. There were five clinics that were dedicated to food law and policy. And then over 100, I think, clinics that were doing something in this space. So I think that shows that the field is really growing. And it's interesting because outside of law, there's a lot of food and academia, there's sort of food studies or food plays a role in public health schools or in sociology. Law in some ways can be a slow field to catch up. We're inherently reactive. A lot of laws are written in reaction to things that go on in the world that we're trying to figure out how do we make that not happen again or how do we better prepare for that in the future. But it's been really a meteoric rise in terms of the value that law schools have given to this, maybe not as like part of the first year required curriculum, but it sits at the heart of so many other societal concerns like environment and sustainability, public health, economic justice, racial justice. When you frame it as being tied into a lot of those things, there's really been a lot of interest amongst scholars and amongst law school leadership. So that was kind of the big picture. So suddenly you were taking on big policy and putting together big conferences, not to put too feeble a phrase together, but What was the first big win where you hit the limelight? That's a great question. I actually don't know. I'm trying to think if like I can really think back. I'll say a couple of things really helped build momentum. So early on, we said it was me with a bunch of students. They were wonderful, but there's only so much you can do if you're trying to write the syllabus, teach the class, work with the students, keep the clients happy, fundraise to hire more staff. So I think a couple of things really helped catalyze a lot of forward momentum. Definitely one big thing for me was being able to bring in a little bit of funding. So I think early on, because it was new to the law school, they weren't necessarily saying we want to invest in enough money for you to hire all these different staff. But once we were able to convince a couple different foundations and funders that there was something there and even bring in a little bit and be able to have a little bit of staff that Uh, built some, you know, breathing room for me to do some of the bigger planning. The other thing that's interesting was early on, I was very focused on state and local work. And that is still a big piece of what we're doing. But I think the more capacity we had, the more ability to really also focus on federal policy was really beneficial. Because in the food space, there's interesting things going on at both levels. A big thing in the food space is the U.S. Farm Bill. Every five years, we know we're going to have this big funding opportunity. It's the last farm, but was $428 billion. And recognizing that was a big area of action and that was something we needed to dig into. One of the areas that I do a lot of work in is food waste, food recovery, food donation. And we recognized that there was nothing in the farm bill. So we're spending $400, $500 billion to produce food, process it, get it around the country. And there wasn't a single dollar or a single program dedicated to make sure that food didn't get wasted. And so we put out a report saying, here are all the things in the farm bill. Here are the places we should be funding. We had 16 recommendations and nine of them made it into the farm bill in some way, shape or form. The food waste piece was something that you got a lot of sort of professional polish on right away. Yeah, I think on that, actually, this is a good point. The first thing that we worked on that got a lot of attention was a report on date labeling, which came out in 2013. And I think at that point, there's lots of small successes, but the genesis of that was a client of the clinic was Doug Rao, who started Daily Table. The way that I first met Doug was that I think we had coffee and he mentioned that he, from his experience at Trader Joe's, was really interested in thinking about How can we start retail model food rescue entity 
that's really building on the fact that there's so much food that we know gets wasted, even at a player like Trader Joe's, where they were really conscious about those things. He saw how much wasn't getting used. But he said, the problem is, one of the things I'm really concerned about is that the date labels on food are really about quality, and yet all of this food gets thrown away. But I, I know it's illegal to donate or sell that food. So I went to look into it, and what we found was that it wasn't illegal, but it was tricky in Massachusetts. So we started looking around to see, might there be another state that has a better law? And first we looked at five states and then 10. By the time we looked at the whole country, we realized that every state had a different rule on this topic that you would think if it's based in science, if it's based in food safety, states would be doing the same thing. So with Doug's blessing, after we kind of gave him all the information he needed and prepared the confidential materials for him, I said, could we take the data that we found on what this looks like nationally? I think people will be really interested. And he said, totally go for it. And one of the first people I talked to at the time that we were trying to turn that into a national report was Dana Gunders, who at the time was at the Natural Resources Defense Council working on food waste. And we ended up publishing a report called The Dating Game that really demystified date labels and really shared that 90% of consumers think that these are about safety, but they're really not. There's no federal law. It's very unclear what they mean. And and that report got a ton of attention, which I really credit to the NRDC because I think that they did. They had a really good media team and I had no media team. I didn't know what I was doing. Suddenly I would turn on the TV and there you were. And the nightly news. You know, <laughs> I, I think that you really have to take some credit for changing the way people understand all those dates. They really did think that if they had, if they used the milk uh, a day late, something bad was going to happen. They didn't realize that it's really an inventory control mechanism. And yeah, you have to own that, Emily. You did good. Thank you. And that was a major sort of lifting you up to a different platform when people started to pay attention because that was that had national impact and it had impact at the consumer level as well. I have to laugh because we used to make so much fun of my mother because she felt that no food was ever lost. I remember she opened these cans of tomato sauce that probably she had had since the Depression and they exploded all over the kitchen. And she said, well, sometimes it's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> we, so I grew up understanding being slavish about reading the dates. So you made a big difference in me. And instead of throwing out milk that had expired, or I thought had expired that date so that I wouldn't poison my children and poison my my friends, I now actually tasted it. Yeah. And did not die. (laughs) It's great. I think in some ways I feel like on that topic, on the narrow topic of date labels, in some ways we've come a long way. I think people have a lot more knowledge. We've Actual policy change on it has still eluded us. So it gets me heated about that because it seems like a really simple thing to fix that what we've proposed and what most of our peer countries do is having a standard label for quality that everyone knows when you see that, that means that this food can be eaten as long as it tastes good. And then having a standard label for safety-based risk where on those foods, you need to be more cautious. So We've had lots of successes along the way, but it also opened to me this whole space around food waste. And I think in some ways it's a microcosm of the bigger issue, which is when we're really focused on other things in food safety, which of course is important, but we can draw a halo around safety where we like don't allow anything to happen. It's always when in doubt, throw it out. It really opened my eyes to the fact that in a lot of cases, laws are making food waste a lot worse than it needs to be. And here we are wasting now today in the U.S. 35 to 40 percent of our food, globally about a third of our food. It's a really interesting area to look at. What are all these places where the law has a thumb on the scale for us to throw it out versus where we can make it easier and the more streamlined and more financially savvy decision to not waste that food? You went from food labeling to food waste to many other things. And by this point, you had a pretty large group of students every year who were taking your course and active in the society. And you had started to put on conferences, not just about topics, but also with other law schools. So colleagues or collegial relationships could start to get formed between those colleagues. One of the things we did was we started this annual 
boot camp, so to speak, for law students around the country interested in food law. And so that was a great thing. We did them five years in a row, the first one here at Harvard, and then we co-hosted them with another law school at that school. So we did them at Drake Law School in Iowa, UCLA Law School, Georgetown, and then University of Arkansas. And the idea was really to bring together colleagues that taught little mini guest lectures on different topics in food. We had between 75 and 100 law students from around the country that would apply to come to this and get to kind of network. And then they've now built also a national food law student network that they support each other, they hold events, they share job postings, and they also support schools forming new food law societies. I really think one of the flaws in the way that we make policy around food is that we don't view it as a system enough. And so I also think a lot about how are all of the different priorities and stakeholders and legal structures supporting or enhancing the well-being of each other rather than just being really laser focused. We regulate for our food safety. How are we also thinking about public health and sustainability and those kinds of things at the same time? I, I'm going to ask you to just give me a, a granular example of that, but it underscores what I always think that food is the thing that has the most rays coming out of it connecting to in human existence to other things. So it isn't just ever about food. It's about food and everything else and food and this and food and that since everybody eats. Yeah. The issues going on right now with baby formula, I think are a good example also of how complicated this web is that relates to our food. In that case, there's this legal structure around safety that arguably like didn't react quickly enough. At the time, there were whistleblowers, there were complaints, there were issues with the lab making the infant formula. Then when there was a blowback to that, the response was in shutting down production from that lab. But then the fallout was now there's not enough infant formula. So it raises these questions about the functioning of the FDA and our food safety apparatus. It raises issues of consolidation that if you don't have enough production going on in enough locations or enough different businesses, then the system becomes really quite vulnerable. It's also raised this interesting set of issues around the WIC program, which is a totally other area where one of the things that the WIC program supports is families buying formula for infants when needed. And if a lot of the programs are set up that the listed formula are all, again, coming from the same lab and the same company, you suddenly have all of these other challenges. Without getting so in the weeds of it, I think it's a great example of how there's all of these, there's sort of foods like a crucible for all of these other issues that relate to safety and health and opportunity. And and I think it's incredibly interesting. And I think it's easy sometimes to get so hamstrung by the fact that it's a complicated web. But I think also if you just think about the issue you're trying to fix, find the solution to that, but then try to think about how is it not making any of these other parts of the web worse. So I actually, in the first day of class, I often draw on the board for students this Venn diagram of how I think about the food system, which is there's one circle of the Venn diagram, which is food safety. Safety is really important. If anything, I think sometimes we can overemphasize safety, and I've written about that. Another interlocking circle of it is public health, which obviously has overlap with safety, but also often I think our apparatus on safety doesn't do as good a job on long-term health, diet-related disease, those kinds of things. Another would be environment and sustainability. And then the fourth circle that they, again, they all touch each other and they all intersect in the middle would to me be sort of justice, which my students always laugh about because it's so amorphous, but it really is thinking about Who's benefiting from these policies and these structures? Who's burdened? Is it, as we often see in the food system, there's racial and ethnic divide in terms of who are the beneficiaries of the food system and who is burdened by it, both as consumers, as neighbors to agriculture that is harming their health and their property interests. And I think where we find the best solutions is when those things are in balance. But of course, we're not really regulating in a way to do that. And I think that's like where we can come in and think a lot about the projects that we're doing, trying to 
even if we're focused in one of those circles, keep the others in mind and find better policies and better solutions that really try to balance those issues. So you've done a bunch of work in marketing of food as well. I think it's hard on the marketing side because in the U.S., we have this First Amendment protections, which are beautiful in a lot of ways, but also over time have created more and more protection for companies that in ways that I think are really tricky in the food system. It should be a core value that when you are purchasing food, that the, the labeling, the marketing is accurate, that you're getting what you think you're getting, that it's clear if it says it has health benefits, that those are real and not made up. And I think actually in the time even that I've been working in this field, the decisions of courts have pushed us more and more in a direction that makes it really difficult for government to regulate in those ways. So that's something that is constantly on my mind as a big challenge in the legal space that I talk about a lot with students. There's some opportunities, but I think for the most part, that's been a place where I feel like a little bit worried about where we're headed. Talk about where we're headed and talk about what you think the next big topics are. We're paying attention to a world hunger problem that we say is barreling down the pike, especially exacerbated by the conflict in Ukraine. Conflict. Ha, huh, I can't believe I even used that word. What are the next hot topics that we should be thinking about or that mm. you are thinking about? That's a great question. One thing that has been a big part of our work in the past few years is actually taking our the work we're doing on food waste and food donation and food recovery globally. So we have a big project right now. It's probably one of the biggest things I'm working on that we partner with a group called the Global Food Banking Network. And then through them, we partner with food banks or food bank networks now in 23 countries. And for each country, we're analyzing their laws as they relate to food donation, explaining what the laws say, what you must do, and then writing recommendations. And we're documenting what are the best practices across countries and putting out different trainings and issue briefs. And I think some of this has gotten more attention in light of some of the food crisis coming out of the situation in Russia and Ukraine, but just that if we have supply chain challenges and we know that 30% of food is being wasted, one place to tighten up is really thinking about why is that food being wasted? What can we do better? What are the ways to make those efficiencies in that food? And again, the large majority of the food that's wasted is perfectly edible. It's just there's a supply chain problem. In some parts of the world, there's problems with cooling and kind of post-harvest transportation that causes a lot of that. And, and here in the U.S., it's a lot of things that are consumer-driven, like we want grocery stores to always have an abundance of food at all times of day and night. But in order to stock in that way, stores have to overstock in ways that cause a lot of waste. So that's been a big piece. And I think we're seeing a huge growth and kind of interest along that path and more and more countries passing different policies that are either creating some sort of framework to restrict food being wasted or require donations. One of the countries we're working right now in is Ecuador, which just passed a law requiring donations of edible food. It's really interesting to see. The other big thing on the horizon, the next farm bill. So we talked briefly about the farm bill. In addition to the work we've done on the food waste front, we also work with a consortium of seven law schools on a broader set of farm bill recommendations. And we're actually just on the cusp of publishing five reports on all different topics in the farm bill from conservation and climate. There's a lot of energy and momentum looking at the intersection of ag and conservation and climate. We have a report on food access in the farm bill. We have actually a really interesting one that's going to be on workers and ag labor, which is not part of the farm bill, but we would argue it's not well treated anywhere. And clearly it matters both to agriculture and very much to the workers who are, you know, producing our food supply. So there's a, that's sort of a new area that we're saying should be in the farm bill, even though it's not there. So the next farm bill is slated to be next year, 2023. I think we'll see what happens with the next elections. But I think there's a lot of energy in that direction. And, and on that path to there's a lot of discussion about both thinking of agriculture as an opportunity to mitigate climate change, whether through better practices that store carbon, but also in terms of adaptation. 
what do we need to be thinking about? What do we need to have on the horizon? We've done a lot of work also looking at so many of our peer countries have some sort of national food strategy that really lays out their priorities in food. And and we've done a lot of looking at how those have been structured and really advocating for one in the U.S. And I think this this doesn't include everything. I would also like to see some broader strategy. But as far as these topics, this is really, I think, very much aligned with what we've been calling for, which is taking the moment, figuring out what the problems are, listening to affected individuals and stakeholders, and then setting out a strategy for the both short and long term, rather than the way we typically make policy, which is what do we need to do right now to win the next election? And not a lot of long-term planning. Fascinating to me to look at the arc from where you started to the kind of things you're influencing. And here you are, little Emily Broad <laughs> at the center of it. Did you ever imagine, was food ever an issue for you? It's hard to say like how much I really fell into this. I think my own experience, like I have a love of food. I I grew up in a family where my mother was an amazing cook. Family dinners were a thing. We didn't struggle with food. And another formative experience for me was in college. I was a history major. And one of the best courses I took was a course on food history, which was really interesting and really talked a lot about the ways that you can shape, you know, trace the arcs of history through different food cultures and where they spread and how and that is really embedded a lot in like understanding cultures and understanding food the movements of peoples and so of course at the time it was a really interesting class I never it didn't really drive me towards anything in particular I think for me it's been really that this was a way to work on the things that brought me to law school which was very much an interest in human rights and civil rights and how law can be a tool to help the most marginalized communities. And it's just a really concrete way to do that. And I think the longer I've been in the field and the more connected I am with like the farmers we work with or community groups or schools that we've supported, it feels like a really rewarding place to be. So I can't imagine doing anything else, but I have to say I really got lucky and fell into this amazing academic and career path. I just think it's, I'm entertained because I've been, as we've spoken, I've been uh, watching you since the beginning where you were, yeah, I'm an advisor to this group and I don't know what's going to go to now. Here you are working on policy issues around the world. (laughs) It is really a joy to see all this happen. Thank you, Emily, so much. When it comes down to it, there's so much that's important to happen around food and you've really been, you've been a huge mover. Thank you. Give yourself credit for that. Thank you so much. This is great. We'll talk soon. Thank you, Emily. Listeners, if you want to know more about Harvard Food Law and Policy Clinic, visit their website at harvard.edu backslash food law. Thanks for listening. Let's Talk About Food is produced by The Food Voice. I'm producing, along with audio director and composer Mike Moss of Soundscape Boston. You can find more of our stories at our website, letstalkaboutfood.com, and on Heritage Radio or wherever you get your podcasts. Let's Talk About Food is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradio.org. Connect with us on Instagram and Twitter, at heritage underscore radio. You can also find us at facebook.com slash heritage radio network. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Subscribe to the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join the HRN family by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage.